Test, test, test. Test, test. I get, I mean, test, 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 test.
All right, uh, maybe we'll get started here for day two. Sorry to interrupt your conversations. Grab some, I don't know what, steaming scrambled eggs back there uh, and take a seat, if you would. Uh, my name is Peter Trappa. I'm Dean of the College of Science. And on behalf of the college, and of course, on behalf of the Wilkes Center, I'm delighted to welcome you to day two of the Wilkes Summit. Of course, this is the inaugural Wilkes Summit, which will become an annual fixture of the activities of the center. And as I was coming up, uh, here this morning, I was reflecting on this great lineup of, of plenary and keynote speakers that we have this morning, and I was thinking about them in the context of Clay Wilkes's remarks yesterday morning. Some of you may have been here for that. And so Clay kind of sketched his vision a little bit. You know, he talked about a few things. One, of course, was the importance of innovation uh, in, in climate solutions and, and entrepreneurialism and the importance of climate tech. And I think our first speaker, uh, Joe Moore was going to talk about the Forge project, you know, decades of experience with geothermal, which has been commercialized in different ways, capitalizing on some of the unique geology that we have here in the state of Utah. I think that fits perfectly with, with what Clay was talking about. Uh, secondly, Clay was very interested in leveraging the activities of the Center for Institutional Change, and the thing that he mentioned explicitly was the investment uh, required in, and that we've made in accelerating the transition to net zero uh, carbon emission on this campus, and I think our second speaker, our Chief Sustainability Officer, Carrie Case, will talk presumably about some of that in the context of a, a climate action plan that she and a team are formalizing. And what Clay was saying is it's not so much about what's happening here, but what could happen at other places, this whole network that you could imagine uh, of, of, of activity at universities and the impact that they could have collectively. And then finally, the center was conceived as a place where objective science is put in the hands of decision makers, whether those are corporate decision makers or policy makers. And that requires interfacing with state agencies, federal agencies, a lot of state agencies represented here today, of course. Um, and we've had a, a great tradition of leadership in the state of Utah at the highest levels. We're gonna hear from Speaker Brad Wilson, of course, later today, who for many years now has led out on practical, executable solutions, whether it's around air quality or water, and you know, continue to accrue momentum, especially as we think about the future of the Great Salt Lake. So a good lineup, that's a little bit of a, a thumbnail sketch and how it fits with the vision of, of how the Wilkes Center interacts, not only with the College of Science and the University, but beyond. Um, and now I'm gonna turn the time over to my friend and colleague, uh, distinguished professor of mathematics, Ken Golden. Ken Golden is, is kind of a rare bird. He, he applies some of the most sophisticated applied math and physics to the study of the microstructure of sea ice. Sea ice, very interesting composite material. There's all these salty brine inclusions. And so this microstructure uh, dictates uh, macro properties, which are increasingly important as we think about how to model weather and climate. And, and Ken and some, some of the other uh, folks in this room have been leaders in, in that area for a long time. Uh, one of the things that, uh, Ken has a long list of, of awards and I won't recite them here, although Ken usually likes me to do that, but I'll, 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 uh, uh, the one thing that he's doing this year is he's a presidential impact scholar. So um, this is a, a new program uh, that our president, Taylor Randall, whom you heard from on the video yesterday, um, ha had conceived and launched and Ken is in that inaugural class of impact scholars. And the idea here is how can public research in universities be leveraged in a way for what our president likes to call unsurcidal, uh, unsurpassed societal impact. And I can't think of any better person than Ken as such an impact scholar because he's such a great communicator and a great, uh, a great scientist himself. I'll, before I turn the time over to Ken, I'll, I'll close on just one personal note and he knows what I'm gonna say, so he's probably blushing already. But um, you know, we were very lucky to recruit Ken from Princeton almost 30 years ago now. And uh, one of the draws for Ken coming to the University of Utah was, was the proximity to Alta and skiing. And for a number of years, he, and, and well deserved, he held the title of the best skier in the College of Science. And he held that title all the way up into 2001 when something very important happened. That's when I arrived. So, <laughs> so all right, without further ado, Ken. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Peter. I really appreciate that. Uh, that was quite an intro. You do know me pretty well. Thanks, thanks very much for that intro introduction. And, and as you mentioned, um, Alta Ski Resort, which is just uh, 26 miles from here, 
had a whopping 903 uh, inches of snow this season, delighting skiers with tons of fresh powder all year up until a few weeks ago. And solitude is still open. But what about 10, 20, 50 years down the road? Suppose you're in the ski industry or an investor. Was this the start of a period of great abundance for our ski resorts? Or was it an aberration, a last gasp before the climate system settles into a drier equilibrium that may not be so favorable to skiers? And what about our neighbors in Colorado or the Sierras? With such questions in mind, I'm delighted to welcome you all to day two of our Wilkes Climate Summit, which will provide deeper dives into the science behind these and other questions, as well as plenary and keynote addresses on issues that will affect all of us. You'll be able to hear a broad range of viewpoints, see cutting edge scientific advances and innovations, and experience an enlightening exchange of ideas at what we believe will be a seminal event for climate science and solutions in Utah. Now, our snowpack and precipitation patterns are not just of interest to skiers, they're of critical importance to our water supply, to agriculture and industry, to creating the conditions for drought and wildfires, and also to the health of our Great Salt Lake. As we'll hear from Speaker of the Utah House, Brad Wilson, we're so delighted uh, and honored to have you here to, to give a keynote address this morning, and uh, we're really looking forward to your remarks. Just like the snowfields of the Rockies, uh, one can ask about the future of the cornfields of Iowa and the wheat fields of Kansas. City planners in Miami, Boston, or other coastal cities are certainly interested in long-range predictions of how rapidly sea level will rise. Providing policymakers, business and industry leaders, state and federal agencies, other stakeholders, and the public with data-driven, science-based assessments of our current situation, how we got here, and projections of what we may face down the road is one of the, our most important jobs as scientists and academics. Moreover, basic research in math, science, and engineering is the lifeblood of major technological advances and innovations that can accelerate climate solutions and propel society toward a more sustainable future. The main challenges in developing a broad palette of potential climate solutions all pretty much boil down to science, engineering, and math problems. Examples include how to optimally design advanced materials to better convert sunlight to electricity, how to efficiently store and transport energy, how to best extract energy from winds, tides, and waves, just like we heard yesterday in one of the prize lectures, how to design and build clean technology products that the public embraces, such as, I'm sure, uh, yesterday they were hoping how to optimally tune the microstructure of thermally smart nanocomposite coatings for windows, as in, we heard about in the pro one of the prize lectures how to capture or sequester greenhouse gases before they enter the atmosphere, how to engineer algae and other microbes to make better biofuels, what to do with the waste from nuclear fission, and how to harness the power of the stars from nuclear fusion. Moreover, most of these big issues, like Utah's snowpack, water and wildfires, or even developing the next generation of batteries for storage applications are complex and highly cross-disciplinary typically requiring expertise from several scientific, engineering, and mathematical disciplines. Interaction with state, local, and federal governments, involvement with business and industrial partners, and funding from federal agencies or private foundations. Indeed, our final keynote today will be given by David Manderscheid, Division Director of Mathematical Sciences at the National Science Foundation. Thanks so much, David, for giving us NSF's perspectives on these issues. We're really looking forward to your remarks uh, later this afternoon. Before we go further, I think it might be useful to mention the 800-pound gorilla that can overshadow and make climate pro projections that much more difficult. You know, or should I say the 800-pound polar bear just to our north? I don't mean Ogden, I mean a little, little further north. When people hear that the average global temperature has risen by about a degree Celsius, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, since the mid-20th century, it might be easy to dismiss the significance or magnitude of this warming. But if we look to the north, we see the frozen surface of the Arctic Ocean, Earth's refrigerator, that reflects sunlight during the polar summer when the sun can shine 24-7. And it protects the ocean from too much solar heating. But we've lost about half of this summer sea ice cover, not 5% or 10%, 50%. Not over the past million years, like on geophysical scales, not over a thousand years, but over the past 30 or 40 years. Indeed, on February 13th, 2023, a couple of months ago, even in Antarctica, we just saw a new record low. 
But just like throwing a rock into a pond, there are ripple effects. And the bigger the rock, the bigger the ripples and the further they go. The extent of the sea ice we've lost in the Arctic is about two-thirds the area of the contiguous United States and is probably the largest change on Earth's surface due to planetary warming. That's a big rock. Having been to the Arctic 11 times over the past 22 years and to the Antarctic seven times since 1980, I've seen tremendous changes in the polar marine environment over this period. From a human perspective, I've seen significant impacts on the native communities along the northern coast of Alaska. How these ripples affect the global climate system, weather and precipitation patterns in North America, our ski industry, the Great Salt Lake, and our drought and wildfire conditions are particularly difficult yet fascinating problems. The speed of the changes and the lack of equilibrium as well as the feedback effects further challenge modeling and prediction efforts. But what I hope we can all take away from these observations is that we're literally all in the same boat, planet Earth, and that the sheer complexity, scope, and highly interdisciplinary nature of these issues necessitates that if we're ever really gonna get anywhere on them, we must work together across ideological, academic, intellectual, as well as party lines to achieve big goals that will benefit all of us. A principal long-term goal being responsible, knowledge-based, data-driven stewardship of our boat and its resources as we set sail to the future, particularly as we turn the helm over to our younger citizens. Finally, a few hopeful, optimistic observations that I'll make as somewhat of an outsider to climate science. That is, I'm a math teacher whose only formal training and early career research is in mathematics and theoretical physics. I did start working on sea ice in high school and college, but I only became involved in the larger questions about our climate system much later in my career. First, climate science is attracting far more interest, talent, funding, and resources now than in the recent past. The 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for climate modeling and prediction. Uh, climate science is now a vibrant, active area of study in applied math, uh, physics, as well as the geosciences. And sustainable energy is an increasingly large component of engineering curricula. Significant increases in federal and private funding for climate research have brought us to a new level of activity and excellence where the most advanced ideas and methods of math, physics, computing, and data science, such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, persistent homology and topological data analysis, and uncertainty quantification are brought to bear on these most challenging of problems. Secondly, Having lived in Utah for over 30 years, we seem to have an unusual capacity and desire here to come together and solve problems where our leaders often work across party and ideological lines to get big things done, even on controversial and divisive issues. As evidenced by this climate summit and other developments in our state, I hope the time is now right for us to see the emerging leading role that Utah can play in advancing the science and in developing innovative policy and practical market-driven solutions to our climate challenges. We would like to particularly thank the Wilkes family and President Randall for helping us get started with the Visionary Wilkes Center. Third, our young people. This is why I'm particularly optimistic. I get to work with some of the most brilliant and creative young mathematicians from 10th and 11th graders to undergraduates, PhD students and postdocs, and so many are drawn to their mathematical talent, to use their mathematical talents to solve climate problems. And it attracts them to mathematics, in fact. An 11th grader working with us now had already published a paper in probability theory before he started working with us on problems at the interface of mathematics and climate science. Uh, I developed an upper level math course on climate modeling and watched enrollment grow from four to 25 after teaching it a few times over the past decade. I regularly teach large calculus classes and interact with hundreds of undergraduates each year. I have certainly noted that our younger citizens are increasingly aware, interested, and engaged in issues affecting Earth's climate, as the decisions we make now have the potential to significantly impact the world they inherit. Lastly, my belief is that addressing and overcoming the challenges presented by our rapidly changing environment provides us with some of the greatest opportunities that we have ever seen for innovation and problem solving, investment, spawning new markets and industries, job creation, and not to mention revolutionary advances in math, 
science, and engineering. Kind of like the amazing scientific and technological advances that were ignited by overcoming the seemingly insurmountable challenges that humans faced when we first went to the moon and beyond. Thus, I'll leave you with one of, one of my very favorite Latin phrases that sets the compass toward our highest aspirations, per ardua ad astra, through adversity to the stars. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic words to start the morning. Let me add my voice in welcoming you to day two of the Wilkes Summit. I want to make a quick schedule note, which is we're actually going to do our two plenary speakers back to back this morning and then switch the, the coffee break after the second plenary speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first plenary speaker, Dr. Joseph Moore, who received his PhD in geology from Pennsylvania State University in 1975, and after a short stint as a uranium exploration geologist, joined the University of Utah. He is currently a research professor at the university and serves as the managing principal investigator of the Utah Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, or FORGE. Dr. Moore has worked on geothermal exploration and development projects throughout the world and has published more than 150 reports and peer-reviewed papers on his research. He is recognized internationally for his work in advanced geothermal energy development. Welcome, Dr. Moore. Good morning, thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And, and Ken, if I, if I can follow on, the segue, um, because you gave me a great opportunity here. So if I ask people in the audience, what do you think about renewable energy? What comes to mind? Tides, wind, solar, anybody think about geothermal? Ah, fantastic. What university uses more geothermal energy than any other university? Yes, we do. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about FORGE, maybe the geothermal of the future, and we'll talk about what we have uh, now. This is a picture of, of the FORGE project, okay? Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. Set the stage, it's a $220 million project. It's uh, about three and a half hours from here, near the city of Milford, a uh, small sleepy town of about 1,500. It's claimed to fame as it has four world bucking bronco champions. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're, here we are out in the middle of nowhere, but I'll show you it really isn't. It's three and a half hours from here. We're currently drilling a well. Um, and love to talk to you about it as we move along. Do you need to advance or do I? There you go. Okay, so some of the benefits of, of geothermal you can see here. I'm um, sure you know, no emissions. Almost all geothermal plants built today have no emissions. All of the fluid and gases that come out of the ground, there aren't very many gases, go back into the ground, into the reservoir. In fact, they, they go in by law. We have to re-inject the fluids into the reservoir, right? Um, it's environmentally benign. The, the area we're at, there are really no environmental effects. In fact, there's no sage grout, there's no prairie dogs. Um, there are a few hawks, but they're not endangered, and some milkweed for the butterflies. Uh, but as you could see, nobody lives out there, and I'll explain that. It's renewable. It is a vast resource. It, it can't be used up, okay? And we'll talk about that. Um, we talk about base load, so solar and wind, you know, out here, they run 25% of the time, 22% of the time. Geothermal runs 24% of the time. But that's not its best use. Peaking is a much better use. So you think about California, and some of you may be familiar with the duck curve, right? At night, solar and wind don't work. Geothermal does. So we can bring geothermal in when other renewables are, are not providing the electricity that we need or, or heating. Um, small geographic footprint, 
you know, windmills, huge, huge acreage. Um, and, and I'll give you a picture of that. Uh, we're looking at five acres for a typical geothermal plant, uh, something on that order. And then it's inexhaustible. Uh, we'll talk about some of these uh, different applications. And I don't have a clicker, so can we go ahead? Thank you. So geothermal, have you seen it here? Well, if you, if you have not seen it here or have not been exposed to it, walk across the street. Right? The Gardner building is entirely heated by geothermal energy. These are heat pumps. They go down, what, uh, and, there are 170 of them. They're underneath the soccer field, so you don't know where they are. And they go to 350 feet. They don't use water. Okay, they just use the heat in the ground, and during the wintertime, we extract it. During the summertime, we put it back in. Okay, so it's a basically a simple-minded battery. Okay, and in the upper right, this is actually a Swiss hotel, but you can see how they work. These, these tubes are filled with antifreeze, so they don't freeze in the wintertime. Okay, and they move, move up and down the wells, and, and you can use a blower okay, to, to transport the heat. A picture of it, you can see how much we're saving, 60, 62000 a year. But go, go visit the building. I, I've taught classes there, not one student knew they were in a geothermally heated building. So, and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful building. It, it is the fastest growing form of geothermal energy today, better than 25%. Move on? Okay, so as I mentioned, Gardner Building does not use hot water. All other forms of geothermal energy do. And this is what a, a conventional geothermal system looks like. Hot spring system, you have all seen them. It's very simple conceptually. Cold water is dense, it sinks along faults like it sinks along the Wasatch Fault, right? As it sinks, it heats up, it becomes more buoyant, and it rises along other faults. Or, or in different places along the same fault. And we drill into these fracture zones or fault zones, and, and we can tap the hot water and then either run it through a, a plant and produce electricity or use it for, for direct heating. So all of the world's geothermal systems currently are water-based, conventional water-based. And they require three, three legs to their stool, right? They, they require a heat source. It could be just the depth of the earth. You know we, know, we know it gets hotter the deeper we go. It gets 21 to 25 degrees C per kilometer hotter. And, and we know that, so we can tell what the temperature is going to be. Uh, we need fractures, right? We need cracks in the rock. These are not sands like a beach, like an oil and gas reservoir, perhaps that many of you would think of. They're actually just cracks in a piece of tombstone. And maybe 10% of the rock has cracks, okay? But that forms our geothermal reservoir. And, and then we need water to move through the cracks and extract the heat, which is always being replenished upward. Uh, let's move on. All right, so heating, heating is probably the very best use of geothermal energy. And some of you may know that for decades, 330,000 square feet of prison space was heated by one well. And, and in fact, the little guppies and tropical fish you bought at PetSmart and Kmart, you know where they came from? Yeah, they came from the prison. They grow faster in warm water. But, but you can grow shrimp, you can grow prawns. They don't taste very good when you, when you grow them in geothermal. Uh, tilapia, a lot of tilapia is grown in, in warm water. Um, do I have alligators? Yep. Colorado, you can grow alligators. Right, great. For women's pocketbooks and, and shoes. You might want to guess what they feed the alligators. Oh, what's left of the tilapia? <laughs> okay. So you, you can grow all of these. Um, lower down is, is just a friend's um, little drying facility in, in Guatemala. And he, he supports maybe 25 people drying, drying these vegetables called echo fruit. In fact, McDonald's used to bring their onions from lower California to Nevada and dry them there because they don't turn brown in geothermal heat. Um, on the left, Milgro, 
Newcastle. Anybody been to Newcastle? No, oh, one of the largest greenhouse complexes in the world. It's actually in the country. 25 acres of greenhouses. If you got a poinsettia, if you got a chrysanthemum, or you will get a chrysanthemum, 10 miles north of St. George, 25 acres of these. Hey, this California company. So we're using geothermal besides just sitting in the hot springs. Okay? But heating is the best use of geothermal. People around the world really don't need electricity, although it's the most sexy form of, of geothermal energy, right? People don't need air conditioning everywhere. Um, next. Great. So now let's talk about electricity. And this is the Blundell plant. Again, probably not many of you know about it. This is located near Milford, three and a half hours away. Um, there are actually two plants here, and I'll explain that in just a moment. There's a flash plant, which uses steam, and a binary plant, which is used hot water. This plant produces 36 megawatts. It's been running since 1984. Runs about 95% efficiency, capacity. Okay? You can see the entire plant, five acres. You can see the first of 168 windmills. They extend about seven miles down the road, okay? Big footprint. Those windmills, well, we'll come back to it. Uh, they run maybe 25% of the time, 75 megawatts. So they produce, in fact, twice as much energy as our little geothermal plant, which was the first in the basin and range to, um, to come into production. Uh, and so we'll talk more about that. But, but Pretty benign, you know, not many effects. You might see a light on at night. Okay, let's try the next one. Okay, the U.S. currently produces 3,700 3, megawatts of electricity from geothermal water. One megawatt per thousand homes is easier than one megawatt per 750 homes. But, but basically, 1,000 homes, okay? Well, that's, that's trivial. And, and over the last few years, there, there have been uh, right, a number of drivers that, that have focused, uh, focused our attention on geothermal. Obviously, climate change. In Europe, Ukraine crisis, no gas. So big effort to produce more, more energy geothermal. Uh, precious metals, um, lithium, you know, rare earth metals that we need for batteries being produced out of the Salton Sea, uh, and there's more work being done. Those brines are uh, 350 degrees C, and they're about, oh God, 35 weight percent total dissolved solid. Molasses, right? But they contain a lot of lithium. They contain a lot of zinc. They contain copper. And, and so we can, get, we can get these elements out of, of geothermal fluids, and we're starting to look at that. Okay? Um, that's important. In, in the U.S., we have two additional drivers, the uh, Earthshot number four, and you may have heard of some of the others uh, on CO2 and um, solar. But, but Earthshot number four is particularly important. This was re announced by the Secretary of Energy, I think, in September, right? And what she's asked us is to go from 3,700 megawatts to 90,000 megawatts by 2050. And you're not going to do it by trying to produce hot springs. You know, 10 megawatts a time, you cannot do it. It's physically impossible to get to, to 90,000. That's a big number. Right? And she's also asked us to reduce the cost of enhanced geothermal systems. I'll talk about that. Uh, by 90% by 2035. That's a huge decrease. They, from six and a half cents per kilowatt hour to, to four. You know, make it competitive with, with other energy sources that get all of these subsidies, uh, because we don't get many subsidies. Uh, and if, if we start to look at the, the temperatures at depth, particularly between two and four miles, um, or, or I'd put it in miles, but obviously kilometers is, is fine. It turns out that uh, Jeff Tester at, at Cornell some years ago now tapping even 2% of the energy or the heat at that depth is more than 2,000 times our yearly energy use. There's a lot of energy down there, right? It's inexhaustible. 
You cannot use it up. And that, you can see, it's now across the country. I use 300F or 150C, C, and that's the, about the minimum temperature you need to generate electricity. So you can generate electricity anywhere. In fact, you can generate electricity east of the Mississippi, which people had not recognized prior to this. Okay? So let's go on and see, how do we do this? You know, where's that energy going to come from? How are we going to get to it? Next. Well, the idea is, is conceptually very simple, right? What do I need? We said we need three things. I need permeability, I need cracks in the rock. I need water to, to transport the heat, and I need heat. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. So three, three simple things. Well, it turns out if I drill in most places in the country, except where there's a hot spring, I don't have the cracks. I don't have the permeability we need to allow water to circulate to heat up, okay? So clearly the goal then is to make cracks in the rock, put water in those cracks, pump the water in, pump it out after it heats up, okay? That's what forge is in a nutshell. And how do we do that? Well, first we drill a well. One of the lessons we've learned is you can drill two wells and then hope that the earth is going to be kind to you and allow you to connect the two wells. Well, these projects have been going on worldwide since uh, 1970s. And the first project, two wells, try to connect them. Stress field was in the wrong place. Okay. We couldn't connect them. So what we've learned is drill the first well. Stimulate the well, and, and that's these little little red lines you see. Okay, much like we do in the oil and gas industry. Okay, we're gonna. This is not the fracking. Well, this is the fracking part. Okay, we're gonna create those cracks. We're gonna case the well. We're gonna poke holes in the well, shoot shoot charges off, make little holes in the well, and then we're gonna pump water in, and we're gonna use what are called packers and plugs, and they're corks. Okay, just big corks. What we find out is that temperatures. Of above 200 degrees C or 400, these corks fail. One, one, of, one of the goals of Forage is to develop new tools for doing this, okay? So, so we, we make our cracks, then we drill our second well. We are currently, uh, let's see. We are currently right in the corner of our second well. Well, about 20 million. So these are expensive. It'll go down 8,500 feet, 10,600 feet long, hit a temperature, sorry, in Fahrenheit, 430. So it, it's, it's warm. You can cook a turkey, right, if you need it to down it. And it does that. So because we need those, sorry, we need those cracks, right, we're drilling that, that second well into the cracks. We know where the cracks are. We've made them. We've monitored them seismically. So we know exactly where they are. And so we'll, we're drilling into those cracks. We will then pump water into the lower well. That water will heat up and we'll pump it out of the top well after it's heated up. And we're only 300 feet apart, but, but the goal is to demonstrate we can connect these. And that, that's a critical goal. So where is Forge? I mentioned Forge is down in, in southern Utah. Um, there is a renewable energy corridor down there, and probably many of you don't know, know about it, but let me explain. Uh, so on the east side, Blundell Power Plant, this is Pacific Core's power plant now, okay? It's the 36 megawatts, 1984. Uh, um, obviously, it's owned by Pacific Core, who in turn is owned by Warren Buffett in mid-America, okay? So he's engaged in in this. Um, as we move to, to the west, we see the Ford site. This is on Sitla land, state institutional land, and that land is, is designated for, for educational purposes, lease it for educational purposes. As we move further to the west, you see the first windrow. I showed you that before, 100, 168 of them. And then further to the west is a solar field. Well, we don't got them all. There's more here, too. What you, what you can see between these windrows are hog farms, pigs. They're about 
250,000 of them were living there. And he, each farm has about 10,000 pigs. Well, obviously, pigs give gas, pig gas, right? Well, Smithfield, who, who owns the pig farms, has figured out that they can uh, trap the gas, clean it up, take the CO2, run the CO2 across the forest site, pump it into um, Dominion's natural gas pipeline. So we have biogas as well. These people are clever. Okay. Well, what makes this site good? Do I have it? No. Yeah. There we go. Endangered species. Obviously, anywhere out in the West, anywhere you have to worry about endangered species. There are none. There's no sage grouse. There's no prairie dogs. There may be one burrowing owl, but I've never seen him. And I know there's at least one kit fox, but, but he's not on our property. So, so we do our archaeological surveys. No, no issues here. Um, um, archaeological surveys, we do those. This is one of the largest archaeological sites out west uh, because of the volcanic glass that, that comes from this lava flow. And um, uh, Fremont Indians collected it. They made their arrowheads. They transported it across, across Clear Creek Cove Fort area, another geothermal plant. We have 72 megawatts of geothermal in Utah. And so there's no archaeological sites that we have to worry about. You notice there's no human activity here, right? There's no crop circles. That's because the water is not potable. It, it has uh, high, relatively high concentrations of, of metals, arsenic, antimony, selenium, boron, chlorine. A and so the state has decreed that it is unacceptable for human consumption. It can't be used for grazing, can't be used for agriculture. Of course, we've leased it because that was the third, third leg of our triangle, right? Water. So, so we own all, all this water. It's all natural. Um, and, and since the community can't use it, it's not a problem. There's another geothermal plant um, just to the south of, of Milford. You can see, see that there. And that's owned by CERC. Uh, they're located in, in Utah. And um, tell me if I get too long. Um, so we have 70, 72 megawatts that we produce in Utah. Cirque's energy goes to Anaheim, not Utah. Enel's energy goes to Phoenix, not Utah. I'm not sure where, where Pacific cores go, okay? <laughs> that, that 36 megawatt. But, but there, um, Utah law does not consider externalities like clean air or ta for tax credits. Unfortunately, Utah law considers uh, energy in terms of the greatest good, which is the cheapest price. Geothermal is not the cheapest by any means, but we're working to get there. Okay? So these are what the wells, we've drilled six of them. Deepest is 9,500 feet, temperatures 465 F. Um, sorry, I, I use feet because drillers use feet and they use Fahrenheit, they don't talk. <laughs> and, and so since we're drilling and collecting samples, it's easier for me. All right, so you can see what the, the megawatts, a large solar field, right, 20, runs 22% of the time. A large wind farm, maybe 25% of the time, geothermal field, and then the biogas. Fantastic. Um, we're currently drilling that upper well. I mentioned we need two wells for a pair. We have an injection well and a production well. Um, what we're seeing here is the other wells. These wells are used for seismic monitoring. So we're putting geophones at depth to monitor the locations of the tiny little cracks that are forming, and most of them are less than a magnitude zero. Nonsensible. Okay. Um, the first well and the second well follow the same trajectory. Drill 6,000 feet deep, turn 65 degrees, and then follow this tangent about 4,000 feet. Forge is the first time that in the geothermal community, wells have been highly deviated, 65 degrees. Uh, in fact, most of them are typically 30 degrees, deeper. Um, first time that wells were cased, and we do that for flow control just like in the oil and gas industry, and is the first time perforated casing. 
New bits were developed that will drill 50% faster, which will save us about 20% total in the dr cost of drilling. A geothermal plant, 50% is drilling, 50% is the plant itself, okay? So cutting, cutting the cost of drilling by 20% 20, 20 is a big, big deal. And that's working with, with the companies. In fact, it's such a big deal that there's now commercial companies, Fervo is one, that is out just to the, the west of us, uh, a couple hundred uh, meters, doing a commercial project there. So using all of the information uh, we've provided. Um, I mentioned one thing, and, and, and I'm gonna di diverge just a minute. I mentioned fracking. God, and somebody's gonna come up or ask a question, all you're doing is fracking. You're gonna create earthquakes all over the place, right? No, <laughs> okay. The technique for creating the cracks and, and in the oil and gas, it's, it's producing the oil and gas from, from uh, impermeable rock, right, requires similar, we, uh, similar techniques. You pump wa water in, you, you create pressure, and you open up cracks that exist, or you make new ones. Okay. In the oil and gas industry, oil and gas reservoirs don't want water, right? You produce water as part of your overall production, right? You can't put that water in. You don't make any money out of the water. And so what the oil and gas industry has to do is take that rejected water, put it in a truck, and take it to an injection site, which may be miles away from their reservoir. And you keep filling up your well and the area around the well. Think of a, a sponge, and you oversaturate that sponge, and eventually you lubricate some faults, and you create earthquakes that are sensible, you know, these three to fives magnitude. Okay? That's not good. Okay? That is the problem with the oil and gas system. If they could use that water, generate electricity, and they're looking to do that, makes great sense. Geothermal does not do that. The water that goes into the well and heats up and then comes out of the injection well goes back into the reservoir. It is reheated and recirculated. So you can't over um, saturate the water or the reservoir, okay? Remember, we didn't start with any water. We made some cracks and we're gonna just recirculate as much of that water as we can. By law, we have to re-inject it into the reservoir. So that's a big difference. You don't have to come up and say all you're doing is fracking. Okay. So you can see what the temperatures look like uh, on the right. Okay, so impact, just, just sort of summarize what, what we've been talking about. Forge is the world's only laboratory anywhere right, that is designed to de-risk tools. There is no industry out there. The service industry, the Halliburtons and the Schlumbergers, these big, big companies don't see a market. And Forge is, is providing funds for companies to build the tools that don't work over 200 degrees C, okay? Tools fail, electric. Uh, you know, any, any kind of electric connections fail. Elastomers fail. You mentioned uh, that we need um, new, new tools. Do we, we need to understand how, how these metals and alloys and, and electrical contacts are gonna work. And they don't at this point. There, there, there is a, a clear need for, for new equipment. So where Forge is funding uh, some of that. Obviously, very low environmental impact. You've seen that. You know, the pads will disappear when we're, we're gone. We'll, we'll replace the pads with um, native grasses, okay? Uh, we provide economic benefits to the community and people, people don't recognize that. When right now, oh, we probably have 70 people on, on the project working. Um, it's a fair amount of people. There's one motel <laughs> in, in Milford. You know, but but we're probably over the over the mo month uh, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars will go to that hotel. There are two restaurants. There's a hardware store. You know we're using local services for sewage, for uh, fuel, everything we can 
is, is being locally sourced. Okay? A heavy equipment operator, one in, in Milford. Okay, we engage the public. Yesterday was down for our quarterly review. We meet with the county commissioners and um, Milford City Council every couple of months. We talk to our senators. We, we talk to anybody. We had a, a parody contest for the kids in school, at Milford School. Uh, please visit our, our website. You can see six or seven videos of, of what Forge is about and, and newsletters. So, so we actively engage uh, the community even before we started, okay? And um, I've mentioned that, and all of the data is public, okay? There's no cost, it's available. So I think with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, as with yesterday morning, please submit your questions using the QR code in the center of your table. But we've got a couple questions already to, to launch us off. So one of the first ones is, what is the main challenge in connecting those two wells? The... Uh, so so since, the, since the mid 70s, uh, attempts have been made to, to connect the wells, develop that fracture network. Um, Obviously, we need fractures. We need to have a fracture volume that is large enough to allow the fluid to circulate, extract heat over long periods of time. When we're earning penny and a half per kilowatt hour, the well costs us 15 years. It takes 15 years to pay back a well, and power plants are amortized over 30 years. So, so we can't draw the, the temperatures or, or take too much heat out of the rocks too quickly. So the challenge really is to build a large fracture network that acts as a radiator. Um, in fact, most of you know the old radiators in the tenement houses in New York, right? They, they go up and down or in your car. That's because that, that increases the surface area and allows us to extract the heat over long periods of time. I cannot, I cannot um, reduce the temperature too quickly or or the project fails. So the short answer is we have to learn how to manage the stress field in the earth. And that's not a simple task. You know, one of the things I find most exciting about enhanced geothermal is this potential for base load and dispatchable power, right? That really makes it this potentially incredible complement to other renewables. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you're exactly right. So uh, not all the companies are doing it, but, but the, the utilities, mo most geothermal developers are not utilities, so they, they, um, uh, they develop contracts, per, uh, PPAs, uh, right? Um, purchase power agreements with, with utilities, and the utilities then dispatches it, like it, at Blundale. Uh, and so there's, California is a good example. During the day, there's just too much electric, electricity uh, being generated by, by hydro, solar, and, and wind. But at night, uh, we don't have those resources. And uh, some of the companies have figured out, at a profit, only to produ produce electricity at night when the others are not, not working. And that's called peaking. It works well. So how can we make sure Utah gets to utilize some of this geothermal energy? Change the laws. <laughs> uh, give, give geothermal uh, credit for, for clean air, for a, a pollution-free um, en energy sources. Um, convince our legislatures that, that, you know, it's worth a tax credit. They do it in Nevada, 25% of northern... Northern Nevada, Northwest Nevada is, is on geothermal. Um, pursue Gardner Building, heat pump. Heat pump's fantastic. You can see, see what it does. It, it wasn't that big a stretch to, um, to build it. We could do it. You know, I, I've heard people say universities are inefficient, but maybe the next speaker will talk more about, you're gonna talk about it, okay. But it's doable. 
it's doable, it's doable in your homes. Um, so we want to encourage that, we want tax credits for that. Buy electricity, you know, from, from producers, encourage companies like Fervo. Fervo is an interesting company, they're commercial, they're all funded by investors. They're working in that temperature range just below 400 degrees F, because everything works. They figured out, if I'm gonna use tools, I need tools, I'm gonna work where the tools work. Encourage these companies to come to Utah and, um, and give them benefits. We're getting a lot of great questions about water as well from the audience. Where does the water come from, from the in, for the injection, and how much of that is recycled? Okay. We, we actually have two sources of water for our drilling and for our other activities of stimulation. I buy water from Milford. I pay a few cents for it. It's a revenue earning uh, for, for Milford, right? They're getting a couple of cents per gallon on it. What could be better? You know, in fact, it's golf course water. And they, they have a little bit of excess water, and so we purchase it and we haul it up and everybody's happy. But we will be, be drilling a, a water well. The water is natural. In fact, it, it, it is in fact related to that um, active geothermal system, the, the Blundell Roosevelt Hot Spring geothermal system. In the early 1900s, there were bathhouses there. I encourage you to go, call me, and I'll take you there. And, and they're old bathhouses, and we can go look at the cowboy brands on the beams, and, and I can teach you how a geothermal plant works. Okay, so call me up, we'll go out there and see it. But that water is all naturally occurring, and some of the water from, from um, that system that powers uh, Roosevelt, which is, which is actually a 250 degree C system, it's very, very hot. Some of that water comes up and, and migrates through, through the gravels as an aquifer. So it's all naturally occurring. And I guess one of the things, as I understand it, Two is once you have this closed loop system, it, the water demands are not that high, is that right? And so somebody might as well ask me, how much are you gonna lose? I'm estimating 10%. Okay. Is this something you can do everywhere in the country or do you everywhere. need specific areas? No, nope. no, the best areas are out west because temperatures are hottest, closest to the surface. But, but what we've shown is that anywhere in the country this could be done. It's just a matter of drilling deep enough, and as I mentioned, uh, let's use 25 degrees C per kilometer, I need 150 C, sorry for the unit change. And um, that'll get me enough temperature uh, to, to be able to generate electricity or, or direct heating. One of the real advantages of this, and, and did bring it out, is for both ele for electricity, you gotta put the electricity into the power lines, right? You, you need transmission lines to, to send that electricity somewhere. Well, wouldn't it be amazing if we could build a geothermal reservoir, create one where none exists where we want it, and avoid spending a million dollars per mile for a transmission line, and going through the permitting process, which is going to take decades to build new transmission lines. We all know that. And, and be able to use it where we want it. Um, as an aside, um, the, 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 the user, the, um, China uses more geothermal energy for direct use than anybody, and I can't pronounce the, the city, but it's Tianjin, and it's just south of uh, Beijing, and it's an incredibly clean city, and they build these systems everywhere. They're just using uh, typical hot water type system, but they use it for hospitals and apartment buildings everywhere. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to do that? Put it in a parking lot and, and avoid these transmission costs. Is there potential for partnering with the oil and gas industry to reduce costs of drilling? It sounds like drilling costs are some of the biggest costs. Drilling costs are expensive. Um, we are partnering with, with them. Uh, DOE is, is funding. Uh, there's a new program called GEOD, which will allow oil and gas companies to propose to, to assist. We are currently working with uh, Chevron, Occidental, uh, ENI, 
our three companies, E&I has a tap, and e now, um, on this project, and, and they're providing assistance. The, and we're using the tools they use, but frankly, the geothermal industry is further ahead than the oil and gas industry in terms of their um, tools and technologies. The largest, uh, for, for years, Unical was the largest geothermal developer with, with plants, 300 megawatt plants in, in the Philippines and Indonesia. And when there was a takeover uh, some years ago, they sold their only profit center to Chevron. And when Chevron needed funds, they sold their only profit center, geothermal. Uh, so we have one time for, uh, time for one more quick one. What does geothermal maintenance look like? How do you have to maintain the wells, the plants? How? Um, we amortized the, the plants over about 30 years, but um, Lauderdale has been running since 1904, Wairaki, uh, 1960s, geysers, 1960s. So they run for decades and decades and decades. A and so they're typical, you know, just, just, just clean out, minor clean out operations, downtime. In, in the U.S., our capacity factor is 95%, which is, which is, you're only down 5%. That's a few days, you know, a, a year. Other countries is not quite as good. But it's just normal maintenance. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carrie Case, who serves as the University of Utah's first full-time Chief Sustainability Officer. In that role, she provides senior administrative leadership for planning and implementation of institutional sustainability efforts across the entire university. Prior to joining the University of Utah, she was assistant provost for the Integrative Learning Center at Westminster College, where she started and directed the, their environments center. And before that, she directed Utah State University's Sustainable Building Demonstration and Learning Center. Welcome. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Yeah, as you all just heard, I'm on uh, what I call the slowest tour ever of Utah higher education sustainability. I've been doing this for 20 years in Utah, and uh, I joke that by the time I'm in my 90s, I'll, I'll probably make it down south, right? So I know that many of you were ready for a break, and you have just been denied. So if you were willing and able, stand up for a minute, stretch your legs, Reawaken your body. My watch is telling me it's time to do so. So um, there we go. Awesome. Uh, I, I think it's important for us to, to, to have a moment to, you know, get our wiggles out. Thank you. Thanks for indulging me there. I got to stand up. I thought you all should too. Um, so as I begin today, I want to start with a note of thanks. Uh, I want to thank Bill and, and John and, and all the, the staff and faculty at the Wilkes Center for putting this summit together. And a huge thanks, obviously, to Clay and Marie Wilkes for um, coming along on this journey and, and, and helping make this a reality to President Randall for his support and vision around how the university can and should respond to climate change, um, to all the people in this room, faculty, staff, and students who are part of the University of Utah who make all the good work that I get to brag about today happen. Um, I don't do this, I, I just get to tell you all about this. So thank you to, to all of you. And to everyone here who's not part of the university for the work that you're doing. If you're in this room, you are probably working on climate change, so, so thank you. I have a clicker, let's see if I can figure, this seems to be a tricky clicker, so let's see if we can make it go. There we go. All right, so here is what we are gonna do together um, in the next little bit. We, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview about the higher education landscape when it comes to climate change, and then talk specifically about how the University of Utah is responding to climate change through mitigation, resilience, and education and research. And at the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about why it matters. 
So this is what I'm doing today. If this doesn't interest you, I won't judge you if you, uh, you know, take, take a break, send some emails. But for those who are interested, this is what we're going to talk about for the next little bit. And I'm going to try and double computer, so we'll see if I can do, um, if I can make this, make this happen. So um, yesterday, Clay Wilkes sort of put out a, a call to action to higher education, to really, in every state, um, be responding to climate change, be thinking about our role. And I have good news. I know Clay isn't here today, but I have good news. Uh, higher education uh, in North America has been formally responding to, to climate change um, at, through the professionalization of the field of sustainability since really around 2005, when uh, what we call ACI or the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education was formed. And then in 2006, with the launch of the American College and University President's Climate Commitment. Um, this is a commitment asking presidents and chancellors of higher education institutions to commit to climate action. And then in 2010, with the creation of STARS, or the Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System, which is basically how we in higher ed measure our sustainability pro uh, progress across dozens of different metrics, uh, climate change, greenhouse gas emissions being a big part of that. So there was this real five-year period where, um, where higher ed began to sort of formalize how institutions uh, are addressing sustainability and responding to climate change. That does not mean there wasn't amazing work on climate happening long before 2005. I would guess there are researchers and people in this room who were at universities working on climate change well before that. Maybe. There we go. So I want to say a little bit about higher education um, and what the role of higher ed is when we're talking about responding to climate change. And I really think it comes down to education, research, modeling, and partnership. Uh, higher education has a responsibility to pre prepare a climate-ready workforce through our, cli through our educational programs. And when I say climate-ready workforce, uh, um, I'm not just talking about people who know how to install solar panels. So I've heard at the summit yesterday a call for uh, additional tax lawyers who understand climate change and, and can help us figure out the, the, the uh, tax incentives in IRA. I heard a call for people who have deep knowledge to support tracking and accounting skills for carbon reporting. Um, our keynote last night talked about sustainability fluency, that uh, our, our future workforce understood the sort of complex sustainability and climate systems. Um, I also would note we're, we're largely talking about, about scientific uh, knowledge and contributions today, but I think about the humanities and communications. I think about that story in the New York Times that got so much attention on the Great Salt Lake, right? We need everyone from their different disciplines bringing skills. And higher ed has been, this is the focus of what we do, and we're well positioned to contribute in this space. The second is research. So we have the ability as higher ed to contribute research that increases our understanding of climate change as well as potential impacts and solutions. And again, I think about this across the spectrum. And one of the, the, the outcomes of that can be providing reliable information for policy and decision makers. And I'm so excited to have the Wilk Center um, here at the U now with a focus on doing specifically that. I think also, and this is what you all are probably expecting me to talk about today, and I will, we can be models for solutions um, in our institutional operations. And I'll talk a little bit today about how the University of Utah is doing that and looks to do that in the future. And then higher education institutions are partners with our local communities. Um, sometimes those partnerships are tense. <laughs> right? Uh, we, we operate sometimes in different, um, in different worlds with different goals, um, but that partnership is how we collectively move things forward, and I think that's a critical role. Well, here's the good news. Clay, here's the good news. 
600 plus North American in higher ed institutions have formally committed to taking action on climate change through the signing of the president's climate leadership commitments. These institutions have committed to pursuing climate neutrality, to publicly reporting their annual greenhouse gas emissions um, in a transparent way, and to providing education, research, and community engagement related to climate change. And the University of Utah is one of these. Uh, the U has uh, made our first formal commitment to address climate change back in 2008. Oh my goodness, that's quite wonky. Uh, back in 2008, um, when President Young signed on to the new American College and University President's climate commitment and established our target date for carbon neutrality as 2050. Um, in, in 2010, we released our first climate action plan. And then there's this big gap here between 2010 and, two, and 2019. What was going on during that time? Really good work, <laughs> right? All the work that the university was doing to implement that climate plan, um, drive down our emissions, respond to climate change, integrate into our curriculum. So in a minute, when I take you through the progress we've made, this is the period when a lot of that was happening and continues today. But in 2019, our students and our academic senate asked the university to do more in our response to climate change and passed an academic senate resolution that led to then President Watkins signing a renewed climate leadership commitment that focused not only on mitigating our greenhouse gases, but also on resilience, preparing for the impacts of climate change, and deeply embedding climate into our curriculum and research. A task force was formed. We conducted the university's first climate resilience assessment. We looked across, many of you in this room were, were part of that effort. Um, and I'll talk a little more about this today, but for, the but for the first time, we asked the question, how is climate change impacting our institution now, and how will it in the future? That was a really important step. Um, we then, when President Randall, who you heard from yesterday, uh, came into office, um, he asked us to accelerate our, our timeline for climate neutrality at the U to 2040. And we are wrapping up a planning process to help us meet the um, goals we have around resilience and that 2040 date right now. So I wanna say a little bit about that 2010 climate action plan. This was a really great plan. <clears throat> and it really represented the plans of this era in higher ed with a focus on the triple bottom line, with specific near-term and long-term and ongoing actions, <clears throat> excuse me, and with a focus on driving down our operational greenhouse gases. What was missing from this plan was the inclusion of University of Utah Health. Um, we are uh, one of the major healthcare providers for the state and the region at the university. Missing was a deep focus on resilience. Um, in 2010, and I was at another institution doing a climate plan about this same time, we still talked about climate change as something that would happen in the future, right? It was still about how do we, what are we preventing? This is something that has changed today. Also, the, this plan did not really think about equity and who gets impacted and who is disproportionately impacted by climate change. Um, and so those things are different as we go into creating our new climate change action plan for the university. It includes a focus on mitigation, just a fancy way that saying how we will reduce our operational greenhouse gas emissions and improve uh, local air quality. Resilience, how we're preparing for the current and future impacts. Education and research. I was surprised at how little of the early conversation, and again, I've been in this conversation for 20 years, in higher ed talked about education and research. It's really important how we manage our operations at the university. But if we aren't focusing on climate change and our contributions in education and research, I would argue we are missing our biggest climate impact as an institution. And so this is a big focus for our new plan. And equity, 
how we're prioritizing the needs and voices of those who are both on our campus and in the community who are most impacted by climate change. So I want to say a little bit about why. Why are we centering equity in this? So climate change does not impact everybody in the same way or equally. Think about hotter summers. The, that burden of increased cooling cost hits harder for those who are low income. There are economic implications associated with the transition um, to renewable energy. And there are communities in Utah that will be disproportionately impacted by that transition. And we know that historically marginalized communities, from some of our own researchers we know this, contribute less to the causes of climate change, but experience significantly more of its negative impacts. We also know that many of these same communities hold knowledge and cultural practices that offer profound solutions for reducing and adapting, and adapting to climate change. I, I saw Darren just walking the room back here, and I think about the work that he is doing with Utah State University, um, using his grandmother's plant journal to restore ecosystems in northern Utah. That is deep knowledge, um, deep indigenous knowledge that help us address the, the, the climate challenges that we're facing. Also, not for nothing, the university community repeatedly asked us to center equity in our response to climate change. We heard it again and again and again. It was one of the most common themes. And I don't think that should be surprising because equity, diversity, and inclusion are core foundational values of the university. So why wouldn't it be part of our response to climate change? So it's one thing to say that, what are we actually doing? in our climate planning and in our responding. Well, we started with best practices from peers. I will tell you that was a little hard to find. There's lots of institutions who say they want to incorporate equity into their climate response. There are only a few who have done so, so far. We included this from the beginning. We articulated it again and again. Why does this matter? Why are we doing this? We hired a team with an equity specialist um, and on our consulting team. We held a um, parallel stakeholder engagement process, uh, acknowledging that often members of historic, historically marginalized communities do not participate um, and experience barriers to participating in typical planning processes. So we held listening sessions both on and off campus with um, community groups and uh, student faculty and staff groups. And in all of these, we connected through established relationships so that as a university, we weren't going in um, to communities and asking them to tell us how climate change was impacting their lives and, and what was going on, then to just leave and do nothing about it. So we worked with communities where we've already made a commitment to action. And you see here, how many people have seen this before? Yeah, okay. So this is um, the EPA's environmental justice screening tool that shows the, uh, the darker green are areas that are identified with higher levels of uh, environmental injustice in our local community. I also want to say a note, because remember I talked about this plan um, really it, is a 1U plan and that involves our healthcare side and there are particular connections with climate and health. How many people have seen this before? Yeah, okay. I'd like there's a little room balance here. Everybody sat on this side. Uh, so right, you can see this is the CDC's uh, illustration of the connections between climate and health. But what we know is that we do know that climate change is already impacting health, but it's not impacting it equally and that um, vulnerable populations experience these uh, impacts more greatly. And, um, and so as a healthcare system, this is something we need to be prepared for. Maybe. All right. So let's go really quickly through what is, the, she's like, look, she's, already, she's not telling us, what's that you actually do in here? Let's go through that and let's start with mitigation, um, which is really just reducing or preventing greenhouse gas emissions. So a little bit of background. 
Why are we as an institution focusing on mitigation? Well, it can help us avoid the most severe consequences of climate change. So there is still work to do. Even though I say climate change is here, we're talking about uh, resilience, there is still work to do for us um, to play our part in reducing the most severe consequences. Co-benefits, you've heard a lot about this, the co-benefits of improving air quality in the Salt Lake Valley. It, lessen, it can lessen the impacts on historically marginalized communities, and this has been a focus for the U for the past 15 years. And we've made some progress. Here you can see our picture of our geothermal here. Um, uh, so our energy efficiency, um, we are 25% more efficient uh, than we were a decade ago at the institution, efficiency first. Right, and this is an energy savings of 25, or an increase of our um, EUI by 25%, sorry, decrease of EUI by 25% across 17 million square feet of building space. And this helped us uh, meet and exceed our DOE Better Buildings Challenge goal um, uh, about a year and a half ago. We are number 11 in higher education uh, in the US for our amount of renewable energy we purchase with 50% of our electricity coming from renewables, primarily through the geothermal program uh, that, you, that, um, that was mentioned previously. We have in place contract to, for an additional 20% with a big solar project as well. And together, these things have helped us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by about a quarter since 2007, which is what we use as our baseline. That's pretty significant because that's also been a period of significant growth in terms of our campus population and our built square footage. I promise this is the only graph that I will show today. <laughs> this is there, um, but you can see here, largely what's driving our emissions reduction is the reduction in our scope to emissions here. And so you can see where our um, geothermal power purchase agreement uh, went online in 2019 and the big impact. But you can also see some of the great efficiency work that's been happening to drive down those scope two emissions. How many people are familiar with the different scopes of emissions? Okay. For those of you who aren't, um, this gives you a little summary of what we include um, in our greenhouse gas accounting. You can see this is scope one, electricity generated on site, natural gas we burn in our fleet. Scope two is our purchase electricity. And scope three, we are only required through our president's climate commitment to uh, include air travel and commuting, but want to acknowledge that there are all these additional scope threes out there that in our new climate plan we are starting to address, even though it's not part of our inventory. So where are we heading in this plan? So we look ahead, one of our four big goals is to take urgent action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the new plan outlines strategies related to buildings and infrastructure, transportation, procurement and waste, and research. Research in this space is really about strategies to minimize the greenhouse gas impacts of conducting research at the university because we heard during our process that that was important. So let's talk about resilience. So resilience, and we've heard a little bit about resilience here um, over the, the past few days, but this is a big sort of new focus um, for the university's response to climate change. And it really has to do with preparing for, withstanding, responding to, and recovering from both current and future impacts of climate change. And so some progress has been made, but as I mentioned, this is a newer area um, for us as an institution. Um, so it's important for us to address this as an institution because those impacts are happening both now and in the future. Not everyone's them, experiencing them equally. And as I mentioned, we are a major healthcare provider and so we need to take some steps to make sure that not just as an institution of higher education, 
but as a, a major healthcare provider to the community, we're prepared for the impacts of climate-related emergencies. So, I wanna say a little bit about higher education in general and why resilience matters in this space. Um, a, a few years ago, the Second Nature is the organization that oversees the climate commitment that I've been referring to. Their, their uh, Higher Education Climate Adaptation Committee put out a report sort of assessing higher ed's response in the climate resilience phase. And some of the, what they had to say was really sort of, here's why we should focus on it. But I, I wanna talk about what we see um, down here at the bottom with the last two. One is acknowledging the inequitable distribution of climate impacts. That's a real focus for this plan. But also that we're not alone, that higher education has, had not sufficiently considered climate resilience as a focus of our climate response. And that is something we're trying to remedy with this new plan. Maybe. All right. So as I mentioned, our progress in this space, um, this, is a new, this is a new space for us. We did conduct our climate resilience assessment. I'll show you a little bit about that. We've reduced our um, water use by 20% uh, over the last decade. Why does that matter for climate resilience? It's really hard to talk about climate impacts in Utah without talk about, talking about water and how we use it. And so the work we've been doing to reduce um, our both indoor and outdoor water use at the institution helps us prepare um, for future water shortages and price increases. And we've recently incorporated this into U of U health emergency planning and are working to do that for the university as a whole. I mentioned our climate resilience assessment. Um, we, this was the, the point of this assessment was to identify our vulnerabilities and strengths and assets as an institution, uh, to develop initial indicators of resilience. What do we mean? What does it mean for an institution like the University of Utah to be resilient in climate change? It's a big question. We spent about a year and a half thinking about that, developing our indicators, collecting baseline data for those indicators, identifying overlaps and gaps with the community. Again, that partnership piece. Um, and through this process, again and again, was articulated the need to center equity in our response. These were the existing vulnerabilities identified likely to be exacerbated by climate change. We talk about it as a, a threat multiplier. Um, how many of these, anything on this list we haven't experienced in the last three years? How many things on this list have we not experienced in the last three years to such a degree that they made headlines or that we talked about it with you know, people just randomly. I understand we're a bunch of people who work on climate change, but, right, this is such a change. I just, on a personal note, this is such a change to be able to stand up here and have climate change be something that people experience. In 2008, 2005, 2010, this was something we were talking about in the future, and now, we're seeing, we're understanding in our physical bodies, remember we just stood up in our physical bodies, in our communities with our neighbors, kind of what this looks like. And to me, um, that's a game changer. And it's made this conversation around resilience a lot easier. As we look ahead in this space, our goal really is to increase our campus and our community resilience to current and future impacts. And we're looking at strategies, goals, and targets that are around people and preparedness, our natural environment, the ecosystem here on our campus being intact, and of course our buildings and infrastructure. So when we're talking about buildings, when we're talking about energy use on campus, we're not just talking about reductions, we're not just talking about mitigation, we're also talking about resilience. Okay. Go forward. Okay, and lastly, education and research. Because as I mentioned, if we're not paying attention to that, we're missing our biggest impact. We're well positioned to focus on this as an institution because um, 
This is what we do. This is what many people at this institution get up every morning thinking about. Uh, this is what our students are here primarily to do. And this is how we help equip the next generation of leaders. Uh, this is how we prepare, help prepare Utah's workforce and increase their understanding of impacts and solution. And the decisions we make in the classroom and as our research agenda here at the university have impacts that are local, that are regional, that are national, and sometimes that are global at scale. We've made some progress here with 65% of our departments already having sustainability integrated into their, um, into their curriculum, teaching at least one course, about a third of our students graduating from programs that have a sustainability-related learning outcome as part of graduation. Some of this, much of this relates to climate change, not all of it, and we're just now starting tracking um, what in our curriculum specifically relates to climate change. Over 90% of our departments are conducting sustainability research, and the inventory that Bill and Dr. Brenda Bowen did um, as the Wilkes Center was launching identified 72 researchers focused on climate already at the university. Um, and that's on our faculty. That's not including all the amazing students. I hope you all have seen the posters, going down and seeing the posters and the work that our students, um, our undergraduates, our graduates, um, our postdocs are doing on climate change is not even, even captured in that. And we have multiple centers, including the Wilkes Center, um, focused on this, this work already. As we look ahead, really our goal is that our graduates have the knowledge and skills to address the challenges and opportunities of climate change. And sometimes it's hard to talk about opportunities but there are, we've heard about some today, we heard some with the, the prize finalists. There are opportunities here and we need to make sure our students have the knowledge and skills when they graduate to be part of that. And in research to continue to generate climate change research that supports the needs of those most impacted and drives innovative adaptation and mitigation both in Utah and beyond. So, closing, I promised I would talk about this. Why does it matter what the University of Utah does? How many people are part of the U, affiliated with the U? Yeah, okay. So you all maybe care, right? Because this is your, your institution. But I think it matters for everybody. One, we have a big operational footprint. We use about 1% of the energy in the state of Utah. Are we the biggest? I actually don't know that. We were discussing that yesterday. Are we the biggest? We use 1% of the, of the electricity and 1% of the natural gas in the, in the state. So the decisions we make here do have an impact. Um, we have a big economic impact, right? We do over 70 million in research funding uh, with a goal to get to a billion. Some of that impacts our community. And we spend tens of millions of dollars every year uh, on our energy budget. These have, these have economic impact. We're part of the larger statewide community. Um, I think Dean Trappa mentioned our president's vision to, to be an institution with unsurpassed societal impact, right? We can't do that without addressing climate change as an institution. And each year, we are graduating thousands of future leaders. And so those leaders that we're sending out into the Utah workforce and beyond what they know when they leave here matters. And so how the university integrates this into our curriculum matters. Also, so, so, and that's our primary responsibility, right? As a higher ed institution, our primary responsibilities are to our students, our patients, and our statewide um, community. And each of these groups needs us to lead on climate change. And I think we're up to the challenge. So thank you so much. This is how you get in touch with me. Um, and I would be happy to, to have a minute to take questions if we've got time. Um, otherwise, please feel free to reach out, particularly those of you who are part of the university. I only know what I know. So if you are working on climate change, please, please reach out and talk to me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was fantastic.
We have lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to try to go through them quickly. Uh, you showed a map of the EJI in the valley. Yeah. Um, are folks from the West Valley being included in these conversations and goals? Oh, yeah, great question. Yes. Um, so we are working primarily through university neighborhood partners, if uh, those of you are familiar. We were really, really fortunate to have, for those of you who don't know, that's the university's um, program for engaging with uh, uh, residents on the west side of Salt Lake City and increasingly including West Valley right now. We worked through that partnership um, to do listening sessions as part of our climate planning. And right now, the sustainability office is working with university neighborhood partners to explore like uh, their residence committee model so that we have an ongoing reciprocal relationship with folks from those communities to hear their needs, their impacts, their desires, their abilities and assets that they have to bring to this conversation, and also to be accountable back about what we're doing as an institution. So just now putting in place, in place structures. Yeah, thank you. Great question. How do we integrate these sustainability goals with, uh, into the U of U hospital and healthcare system? Yeah, Alexis, I saw you come in. We'll make you get up here. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it starts by having a team, and I want to thank um, the, the team up at U of U Health who work on this. Um, while we are a, a one U institution, um, sometimes we have, different, we have different goals in our healthcare space. And so this happens on the educational side in our health sciences through that same curriculum and research integration that, that, that um, I talked about. But on the healthcare side, this is driven by the great work that that team is doing around efficiency, around thinking about some of the best practices in providing healthcare. I've learned a lot that I didn't know about the global warming potential of anesthetic gases. How many people knew about that, right? So there's a whole, there's a whole host of very specific um, challenges up there. Our healthcare system, um, it has been recognized by Practice Green Health with Environmental Excellence Award and has signed on to the Health and Human Services Climate Pledge, pledging to take steps both around mitigation and resilience in our healthcare space as well. Really important piece of how we as an institution respond to climate change. What are you most excited about in terms of mitigation for the U in the next five to 10 years? Oh, Reducing yeah. Emissions. Yeah. Um, I'm most excited, this is gonna seem really boring, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, it's the, the, the mitigation work that really matters is the sort of stuff that, it's not the big flashy thing, right? It's the millions of things that our team does to increase efficiency, to make our buildings more efficient while still being comfortable and healthy and productive. And that's, that doesn't seem very exciting, but that's the core work. And if we do that first, right, every kilowatt hour saved is a kilowatt hour we don't have to produce. And so that efficiency work is a really, really critical part. I'm also excited to see our uh, solar project in Emory County, Castle Solar, finally come online. It's been, it, it's been delayed through, through, through some things, and I'm really excited to see that finally, finally come online, partially because it's located in Utah's coal country. It takes advantage of existing transmission lines that are already in place, all those, those wins that we're talking about. So I'm excited about that as well. How do you view our collaboration with the state legislature on these issues? Yeah, I, I pitch that back to, to you, Bill, and where, where, where's Natalie in the Gardner Institute? I think, um, I think that there is real potential. I think what the Wilkes Center is doing around making sure that as an institution, we are providing the best information we can to our decision makers who, who have to weigh many things, right? And um, we are a state institution, right? This is part of our role as a state institution. And so I really view our relationship um, with the legislature as one to try and partner on, on moving these things forward. And, and I wanna maybe say a note about that because I've been doing this work, like I mentioned, in Utah for 20 years. And when I moved to Utah 20 years ago, people thought, how are you gonna do this in, in Utah, right? And at that time, we didn't, talk about any of this. And so it has been a sea change 
thinking about um, if you were at the the state panel yesterday to have that panel and that conversation happening at a climate summit is something that 20 years ago I couldn't have imagined 10 years ago I couldn't have imagined and so I'm really hopeful about the continued collaboration and progress in this state thank you so much Chief Sustainability Officer Kerry Case Thanks so much. We are next going to do a 20 minute break before we are back with our keynote from speaker Brad Wilson. I wanted to take a quick moment, however, to highlight, can we put the student innovation prize slide up, please? That in addition to this amazing international prize that you all heard about yesterday, we also run a student prize for innovative climate solutions and those Students, that, that call happened this spring. We received an incredible uh, creativity and, and huge number of submissions about the Student Innovation Prize. Those finalists are here at the summit and their posters are out in the, um, in the poster area downstairs. So please go check that out. These students win a cash prize for their best ideas and uh, go talk to some of those Student Innovation Prize winners. We're incredibly excited to run this, and we'll be doing it again in future years. So let's have a hand for the Student Prize winners. Okay, with that, let's take a, a break, and we'll be back at 11. Two years ago, the state
Right, same time. We are going to get started again with our keynote. If folks could wrap up your conversations. We are incredibly honored and excited to have Speaker Brad Wilson with us today. Brad Wilson has represented Utah's 15th House District for over a decade and currently serves as Speaker of the House, a position he has held since 2019. During his service in the legislature, he has championed policies to make Utah one of the strongest, best managed, and most business-friendly states in the nation. As Utah has faced prolonged drought, Speaker Wilson has championed the effort to protect Utah's natural infrastructure by preserving and restoring the Great Salt Lake. Under his leadership, the House has advanced policies to conserve, preserve, and optimize Utah's water supply. When taking time away from work, you'll probably find Speaker Wilson hiking in the mountains or with his family in their boat on one of Utah's amazing lakes. Speaker Wilson and his wife, Jenny, and their three children and dog live in Kaysville. Welcome, Speaker Wilson. Well, good afternoon or good morning, I guess. It's still morning, right? Yeah, uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction. And uh, we really do live in an amazing state and what a beautiful day uh, it is today. I uh, appreciate, whoa. It's loud. I appreciate the opportunity to get off of Capitol Hill today. We're actually going into a special session later this afternoon. We've got lots of meetings going on down there right now. And uh, uh, we had no idea when we were in session just a couple of months ago that uh, we were going to need to appropriate tens of millions of dollars of additional money for snow removal and uh, emergency repairs to infrastructure because of all of the snow. Uh, but I couldn't be more grateful uh, for all the moisture we've had. It's, uh, it's been a real blessing. Uh, it's great to be with you also at the Wilkes uh, uh, Center and for all the work that you're doing. Uh, I came here to talk actually about the Great Salt Lake, which I think you know. And uh, I want to start, though, and maybe throw you a little bit of a curveball and talk to you about something else. I want to talk with you about another natural phenomenon that we have uh, in this country, the California sequoia redwood trees. Um, you don't think of those when you think of the Great Salt Lake. But you do know, I think, that these are some of the biggest, tallest, and most uh, impressive uh, natural wonders we, we have uh, in the world. These trees get to be 200 feet tall. They're 15 feet in, in diameter, and uh, they're just remarkable. And they've been able to withstand centuries of really, really difficult um, and formidable natural disasters. And what's amazing about these trees is you'd think that to be able to hold these trees up, they'd have to have really, really deep roots. But in fact, that's not the case. The roots are shallow. They go no deeper than 10 feet. And you ask yourself, well, how in the world uh, can they stand these big trees up that weigh so much uh, and have such shallow roots? And, and they do this, and I think you know this, uh, they do this because their root systems are so interconnected. Um, and these trees actually hold each other up so that they can withstand all of the, um, uh, the forces that bear down on those. And over the next few minutes, I keep looking back to make sure the pictures are still there. Uh, over the next few minutes, I want to talk about how I think that relates to Utah's water system. So a f two years ago, roughly, uh, I was getting my morning exercise in. It's the only way you kind of keep your head stayed, uh, screwed on straight sometimes in politics. You have to have a little me time. And uh, I was listening to a podcast, actually, about water and about uh, some of the disasters that have happened around the world relative to uh, these terminal lakes drying up. And uh, 
thought more and more about the Great Salt Lake. And I live in Kaysville. Every night when I drive home, uh, I come off of a bluff out in Davis County uh, to get ready to turn to my neighborhood, and I see the Great Salt Lake and overlook Antelope Island. And what used to be a lake uh, is uh, not a lake anymore. And even today, even though with the water we've had, it's still not as much of a lake as it used to be. And I realized at that time that we were in a dire situation, and we needed to do some things differently uh, as a state. So I called my chief of staff at the Capitol, and I said, we're going to lean really heavy uh, into the Great Salt Lake. And in fact, we did that. But what's been really fun for me is as we have worked on the Great Salt Lake, it's um, become clear that the challenges and issues we have with the Great Salt Lake are really a symbol of a greater opportunity, but also difficulty we have uh, with the way we manage our water in general uh, in our very, very dry state. And the Great Salt Lake is a really big piece of the puzzle, but it is just a piece of our overall water puzzle. So I told you about these interconnected uh, roots of the sequoia redwood trees. This is a map that I think does a pretty good job of describing how our reservoirs and our lakes and our streams and our aqueducts are all dependent on one another and how they work together to provide water uh, up and down the state. But sometimes it's not clear when we think about this, whose responsibility is this? Is this a government responsibility? Is it a private sector responsibility? Uh, is it a nonprofit responsibility to really solve our water challenges in this state? And I think we have learned that this is a statewide task. This is something that's gonna require everyone uh, from every corner of the state with different disciplines and different interests to all work in conjunction with each other. And while I wish that the event that got me super interested in the Great Salt Lake wasn't happening. I wish we weren't uh, faced with the threat of what actually President Randall coined for the first time uh, I heard it, a hemispheric event if the Great Salt Lake were to dry up, and I completely believe his description. Uh, it would be a hemispheric event if the lake were to dry up. I wish we weren't facing that, but there has been a, a bright spot uh, in that conversation. And it's uh, the fact that in politics and in the world today, we're in a very divisive time. Uh, people go to their corners very quickly. They don't often listen to each other very well. And this has been different. Uh, this has been one of those issues where regardless of political ideology or whether you're new to the state or have been here for generations, uh, where you live in the state, uh, people from Southern Utah are concerned about the Great Salt Lake, just like those of us that live up here in the North. This has been one of those issues that has brought people together. And it's been really amazing and fun and rewarding to watch people link arms and commit to doing something that uh, is the right thing to do. And we have made great progress. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. The lake as of today is up 4.6 feet from where it was last November uh, for a number of different reasons. The record snowpack, of course, is the main driver of that, but conservation measures that we've implemented over the last couple of years have also contributed to that. And uh, we also raised a berm on the north side of the lake, which has helped certain areas of the lake rise. And even though we've done that, water is now spilling over uh, across that berm into the north side of the lake. I've got a graph that I think is amazing uh, to show you. <laughs> over the last three years, you can see uh, 2020 is the gray, uh, and that shows you the levels of the lake that year. 21 is the orange, and 22 is the, the blue. 2023, pretty obvious. Uh, uh, it's really, really uh, heartening to see that. But what is not talked about enough in this? The elevation of the lake matters, but what really is, I think, the driving concern for many of us is uh, something that's less obvious which is the salinity levels of the lake. And uh, you're all scientists, so you know this, but if the salinity levels get outside of a healthy range, if they get too low or too high, uh, we face a uh, uh, collapse of the ecosystem out there. And uh, we were at 19% salinity uh, last November uh, in the lake. That is not good. Um, at that level, uh, we were threatening 
uh, all of the uh, ecological systems out there in terms of wildlife in particular. And so to see that number drop down to the 14% uh, where it is today in a six month period of time uh, is amazing. And uh, we're really grateful for that. We expect the lake will rise another probably three feet uh, before it levels out. Um, the high elevation runoff is just beginning uh, to make it down uh, to the valleys. And uh, yesterday I drove up Weber Canyon. I've lived in Utah my whole life up in that area of the state. I have never seen the Weber River have as much water in it uh, as it has uh, today. Snowbird uh, still has almost all of its water um, before it's come down, before it comes down. So a lot, a lot of water still to come. Uh, I told you a minute ago that we're going into special session today. Uh, part of the reason for that is um, this tidal wave of snowpack that is still <laughs> coming towards us is something that the state is proactively doing everything we can uh, to make sure that the risk of flooding and the risk of managing the infrastructure uh, downstream is uh, being proactively taken care of. Uh, it's really important as a state that we're doing everything now to protect that infrastructure uh, because we don't know exactly how this is all going to play out. Uh, this water has been a remarkable blessing, uh, but it does not mean that we're out of the woods yet. Uh, one good water year, I think we all know this, uh, is not going to reverse the trend of decades of a severe drought in this area. And uh, from my perspective, one of the concerns that I have is that uh, because of that chart there, you see everyone thinks we don't have to worry about this anymore. And that in fact is not the case. Meaningful systematic changes to the way we think about water in the state of Utah and the Great Salt Lake are still very, very important. We used to live in a time, very recently, where any water that made it to the Great Salt Lake was thought of as wasted water. And we've learned that's not the case. We've learned that it's very important water. So let me just talk a little bit about why the Great Salt Lake matters. It matters for three, actually I think there's a fourth, but I'll start with three primary reasons. Uh, the first is our environment, the second is our economy, and the third is our quality of life. In terms of the environment, these are the three drivers that concern uh, the state the most. The first is air quality, the second is disruption to the ecosystem, and the third is dust. And let me just talk briefly about all three of those. And number one and number three are actually related to some extent. But uh, last fall, I went on a tour of the lake. Uh, I've done that a number of times. And uh, we got on these airboats and we were heading out um, out of Farmington Bay uh, out to see part of the lake. And as luck would have it, uh, the wind kicked up. And uh, I had a, a front row seat to watching dust rise off of a dry lake bed, toxic dust uh, that has minerals and other things in it that are bad for us to breathe. And I watched that dust rise and move towards downtown Salt Lake City. Now, even today with the lake up four and a half feet, a good part of that lake bed that was exposed is now covered, but by no means is all of it covered. And there's still plenty of lake bed that we wanna see covered with water because that in fact is the way we mitigate those uh, air quality challenges related to that dust. And we talked a little bit about salinity, but uh, in particular, the brine shrimp, uh, keeping brine shrimp uh, in the lake, healthy in the lake are critical uh, for the migratory, migratory birds, uh, millions of them, uh, that make their way uh, through Utah every year. And if that salinity level gets too low or too high and the brine shrimp uh, collapse inside the lake, it's sort of game over um, in terms of a lot of the uh, different issues we have out there related to the ecosystem. Uh, the second area is the economy. Uh, oftentimes we think that lawmakers only care about the economy and that's we do care about it, uh, but there's other things we care about as well. But in terms of the economy, um, there are billions of dollars uh, of uh, economic activity uh, that occur because of the lake um, and thousands and thousands of Utahns uh, make their living and 
and pay their bills and support their families because of the Great Salt Lake for a variety of different reasons. There's also an economic reality if the lake were to collapse. Uh, I think at the very, very low end, uh, it would cost us 30 to $40 billion as a state to mitigate the uh, damage that would be caused to our environment with an exposed dry lake bed. If you look at what happened to Owens Lake in California, which is about a tenth the size, maybe a twelfth the size of the Great Salt Lake, and the billions and billions of dollars that they spent uh, down there, the exponential cost for the state of Utah would be staggering. And just to put that in perspective, uh, the state of Utah generates in terms of sales tax every year, which is how we would pay for that. Uh, we generate about $6 billion a year. So we'd have to take six years of all the sales tax revenue we get in the state and put it into just fixing the Great Salt Lake. I mean, the state, we just can't afford it. Um, so a very expensive issue um, to deal with. And that doesn't include all of the other indirect costs if we have um, health care costs for Utahns going up, for example, because of uh, uh, dust issues and health issues related to the lake. So let me um, switch gear. Or let me talk about one other thing real quick, which is the quality of life area uh, related, that third leg of the stool I talked about. Uh, most of us like to ski. I surely love to ski. Uh, and the smaller that lake gets, we know the shorter our ski season gets because lake effect snow, in fact, uh, diminishes. And so there's a lot of different reasons. There's recreation on the lake that occurs, uh, et cetera. We, um, we know also that, uh, I said earlier, the Great Salt Lake is really a symbol of a broader issue related to how the state of Utah thinks about our water. And, uh, you know, I have three children. Uh, my oldest got married last fall. Uh, and uh, I hope that she and her husband can make their home here and that someday I'll have grandkids here. Uh, if we don't have a better strategy to manage our water, uh, water will be the limiting factor in our ability to have our loved ones be able to live here and our state to be able to continue to grow. And so we've got to get this right uh, for so many different, uh, different reasons. Recreation, agriculture, all of these things are a big part of the quality of life in Utah, and we want to make sure that they continue to be. We um, are, I think, very careful stewards of the natural resources in this state, um, but there's a lot more work uh, to, to be done. The, the challenge right now uh, around all of these things, last year, everywhere I went, uh, people wanted to talk about the Great Salt Lake or they wanted to thank me for what the legislature was doing about the Great Salt Lake. It's not happening as much um, because of all of the water. It's gonna make it harder uh, for all of us to sell the continued effort that I think needs to be invested in managing our water. From my perspective, and this is just Brad Wilson's opinion, We've had two amazing years of legislative focus and commitment and resources of probably what needs to be a 10-year march. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And selling that uh, is going to get harder and harder, I think. So in terms of the legislature and what we have done in terms of taking this issue seriously, between the 2022 and the 2023 legislative session, we did more from a policy standpoint and also from an investment standpoint than probably in a generation combined. And I wanna just highlight a few of those things. The first is um, something called agricultural optimization. And this is basically where you use technology to help our agriculture community cut its consumption by about 30%. Agriculture is by far the largest user of water in the state, but if you can, um, help them use 30% less water, we're talking a lot of water. And this community has been remarkably responsive and willing to help. For every dollar uh, that we have invested, we invested 70 million in 2022, the private sector, our, our farmers, put $4 uh, into this program. And I wanna just show you a quick video of um, uh, how this has been implemented and how it's benefiting the state. Two years ago, the state offered a water optimization 
program that, which required some new technology to be developed and deployed on the farm. And that was the initial stages of the automation that we have now for surge flood irrigation. Historically, if I look at how we irrigated this field, we could only cover half the field in one week. So we developed the software to be able to build schedules. Now under a surge irrigation method, we can cover the entire field in one week. If you automated the entire Bear River Canal system and you automated all the fields, it's possible to save in the neighborhood of 100,000 acre feet per year. That's a big number and, and when you take that amount of water and put it into the Great Salt Lake system, now you have a significant amount of water that stabilizes the Great Salt Lake without further decline. The water optimization program has been a great opportunity to be able to make a lot of improvements over a lot of acres. We've been able to implement things that we only dreamed of before. These projects aren't only going to benefit those farmers and ranchers, they are going to benefit all of Utah. And that kind of is exciting to me to know that what I'm doing can make an impact. So this program has worked so well um, that we actually took and put another $200 million into this program uh, just a couple of months ago. And our agriculture community will be expected again to put a lot of their own resources into it. Uh, but you can see it's a great win-win. It's It makes it easier for them to do their jobs. They use significantly less water. And ultimately, uh, this is actually a numbers game. Uh, we've got to just get more acre feet into the Great Salt Lake. And this is one of the biggest opportunities we we have. Another uh, big step we took over the course of the last two years was the investment of over a quarter billion dollars into secondary water meters. Uh, up where I live and where many of you come from, uh, you can water your lawn outside uh, for the same amount of money every month, regardless of how much you use. And you don't even know how much you use. And um, interestingly enough, we know that good data drives good decisions, even at a local consumer level. And when, um, when those of us that are on secondary water systems that aren't metered get information about how much water we're using, we see the average consumption go down by 25 to 30 percent uh, as well. Uh, let me show you a, just a quick video from Scott Paxman from the Weber Basin Conservancy District that'll talk about how well this program is working right now. We, we lost Scott. I think it's the next one, Casey. HB 242 that was passed last year was a great boost to the entire secondary metering project statewide. It allowed for $250 million of funding to go towards secondary metering which was a lot of small irrigation companies just really couldn't afford to take that step. We've seen a lot of support from a lot of the customers and customer agencies in providing those secondary meters. So it benefits really conservation as a whole and it allows people to understand how they actually use water and to be accountable for the water that they do use. So I don't know if I should admit this or not, but um, I put a meter um, before the d district came in on my secondary system. I had a leak in my system, and I'm not gonna tell you how many gallons a day uh, I was leaking out of our secondary system, but it was stunning. And it was also really easy to fix once we knew we, we had that. Um, so this is making a big difference. We actually put another $18 million uh, into this program this last session, and uh, it will make a really meaningful difference. We think this alone uh, is anywhere from 50 to 70,000 acre feet of saved water. That's the same size as Echo Reservoir. Um, we created another really interesting uh, program. So we're having some technical issues. That's all right. So I can act this out in song. Uh, uh, and uh, I can actually just narrate some of this, but uh, we created a water trust for the Great Salt Lake. And uh, it's actually a bill that I ran. As, as speaker, I don't run very many bills, but we put $40 million into a trust. And um, 
actually are working uh, with the Audubon Society and the Nature Conservancy uh, to oversee this trust. And uh, they are actually charged now with going out and making sure that uh, we're getting adequate resources to the lake, managing water quality of the lake, and they're going out and working with different organizations to try to secure water dedicated to the Great Salt Lake. And we've even seen some of that uh, start to happen. Um, you probably read or you may have read that uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints donated a significant amount of water to the lake, but this water trust is out working with a lot of other groups right now that will be dedicating water uh, to, to the lake. Um, so let's, uh, we skipped a piece, which is actually fine. Let's keep, uh, let's keep going and talk now about where, when you think about the future of the state of Utah and where big decisions have high impact and high leverage, there's no bigger decision about water consumption than the decisions that are made at a local level by local government in terms of how those areas grow. And um, some local government are doing a remarkable job at thinking about living in the second driest state in the country differently than they've think to, thought about in the past. Let's show uh, Mayor Petro from Layton and some of the things they're doing to lead out on water conservation. So I can speak on behalf of Layton City. We've done several different things. We've changed our landscaping ordinance. We've added an app for our citizens to be able to see how much water consumption they've been using. We've got a GSI system to help our citizens understand their own vegetation and the different soils that they're trying to water and keep hydrated. As well as we've been working with Rocky Mountain Power on the pumps that we use within our aquifer and being able to get the water up so we can get it to our citizens. But the biggest thing that I am most proud about is our citizens. We've been able to inform them and educate them on all the different opportunities that we need them to do to step up to help conserve water. I'm happy to say to date, we have over 930 million gallons we've saved. So Mayor Petro is a, a great mayor and she's really leaned heavily into this as well as the city council there, but we're seeing this start to happen all across the state where city leaders recognize that they have such an important role to play in terms of thinking about water differently. Um, so the legislature pulled a lot of policy levers uh, this last legislative session, and I wanna just go and highlight a few of those for you so you kinda have a, a glimpse into some of the strategy that we have uh, put in place. The first, uh, yeah, okay, great. Uh, the first bill I wanna talk about is House Bill 491. The majority leader in the House of Representatives, Representative Schultz, was the sponsor of this bill. And let me give you some back story on this. Um, you know, we created a, I have hosted the last two years a Great Salt Lake Summit where we pull hundreds of people together and talk about the Great Salt Lake. But it became really clear to me that uh, as I kept having all these people much smarter than me with innovative solutions about how to save the Great Salt Lake, that I was not the right person <laughs> to be trying to quarterback all this. I have other responsibilities. And there, there hadn't been a singular person in the state that had responsibility for the Great Salt Lake. We have almost a dozen state agencies that have a part of the responsibility for the lake who are all doing uh, a great job in their own way, but no one was looking collectively at the strategy for the lake. So uh, House Bill 491 addresses that and it appropriates a significant amount of money uh, and resources every year. Uh, and this person, there's only two people in state government in the state of Utah that meet with and report directly to not just the governor, but the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate. And this is one of those two people. That is how important uh, I believe and we believe this role is in terms of having clarity of mission, not just in terms of strategy, but also execution. And we actually just named uh, this individual last week. Some of you know him, his name is Brian Steed, uh, and he'll have this responsibility prospectively. But Brian's job will be to develop strategies and a strategic plan around the Great Salt Lake and then ensure that the development and preservation of the lake, as well as everything from wildlife and recreational facilities out there are thought of, as well as floodplain and of course, quality of the water. And uh, 
a lot of pressure on one individual, but uh, I think it's a necessary step. Another piece of legislation we passed, House Bill 513, really simple, but uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, changes that's happening in our world is moving to electrification, especially of vehicles. And uh, the mineral that's most critical for that is lithium. There's an abundance of lithium uh, that could be harvested from the Great Salt Lake. There's some ways to do it that use a lot of water. There's some ways that uh, create very little water consumption and depletion. But regardless, um, uh, we put a severance tax on lithium. And, you, and uh, that severance tax, and uh, I think it's going to be a significant amount of money, will be 100% of that severance tax will be invested back in the lake and helping manage it, preserve, and, and protect it. Uh, indirect to the lake, but uh, directly related to our water strategy in general as a state. A few other pieces, and I'll walk through these quickly. One of the big messages that I heard, and a lot of us heard over the course of the last year from everybody across the state was, what can I do? What can we do as individual businesses or individual um, homeowners to help with water? And so we... Um, created something called Utah Waterways, which is its sister organization is UCARE. And the purpose of Utah Waterways is to bring um, nonprofits, businesses, leaders together, and collaborate on how to get everyone to work together, but also give clarity on what we can do individually as well as collectively. And so it's going to be a, a great tool. We have a lot of non profits and businesses that have already contributed resources to this and want to participate and this thing will get fired up here in the next 60 days or so. Um, Senate Bill 53 just says we've got to make sure we're thinking about groundwater in terms of our strategy as a state and um, seeing storage of groundwater as a positive benefit and managing it more proactively. Senate Bill 119, you hear oftentimes that Utah uses far more water than all of our neighboring states per person. Well, part of the reason for that is they calculate their water consumption differently than we do. And so uh, this bill will put us on a level playing field with our neighboring states, and we can actually, in a fair way, calculate how much water we're using per person and per household. <clears throat> um, and by the way, we're using far less per person and per household than we used to, but there's still opportunity for us to be, to be better. Uh, Senate Bill 1, oh, we already talked about that, Senate Bill 450 uh, basically just says tyrannical homeowners associations can't uh, beat up uh, people that want to use their uh, water resources a little bit more uh, responsibly. And uh, that was kind of a joke, but people usually don't like homeowners associations. So uh, some of them are all right. All right. Uh, so we talked about, that's policy, but there's another really important job the legislature has, which is, which is appropriation. And uh, in 2022, the legislature put almost half a billion dollars uh, into water. Primarily, actually, I think the main benefactor of that will be the Great Salt Lake, um, but other parts of the state benefit as well. And this last legislative session that just ended a couple of months ago, we put another half a billion dollars uh, on top of that. And... Uh, uh, not all just for the Great Salt Lake, but for other water projects uh, across the state and benefits. Uh, saving and securing the Great Salt Lake um, and making sure we have a better water future uh, is really, really uh, something that is important and that the legislature is uh, committed to. I've said it, but I'll say it again. One wet winter is not going to solve uh, our problem and the challenges we have with two decades of drought. And uh, the significant moisture that we've had, A, does not mean we can, and it does not mean we will stop being, we will stop our focus on this and we'll stop doing the important work that we uh, have done. We're going to build upon it. Uh, this is not a small task. Uh, someone asked me yesterday, Brad, do you think you've solved the problem? And the absolute answer is, heavens no. Uh, there is more work to be done. But if you would have asked me two years ago, could we have accomplished as much uh, in the last 24 months as we have around water, and in particular the Great Salt Lake, I would have said you were crazy. 
Uh, it's been amazing to see, and uh, there's credit sh that should go to so, so many people for the great work that uh, has been done. This is absolutely a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, I said we've finished year two of year 10 in terms of this march, but hopefully uh, within uh, the next eight to 10 years, we can actually answer that question with yes. The strategy's in place, we've executed the strategy, we've got the systems we need, and uh, we're off to the races. So I appreciate your interest uh, in this and the great work that you are all doing. Um, lastly, I'll just say this, lawmakers are at their best when they're getting feedback, getting ideas, uh, getting encouragement and, and kind rebuke, uh, not mean, but constructive criticism, uh, if there are things we can be doing differently. Uh, we really in enjoy the engagement, and uh, uh, so please know you're part of the team and part of the solution as well. I'm happy to answer questions, but I have no idea if we have time or not. So do we have time? Okay. Is that all right? Yeah, you're the boss. Great. So. <laughs> well, first, let's thank you for that. We've asked folks to submit your questions using the QR code here. We've got some fantastic... This is a little scary, but uh, all right. Oh. Got some great questions already. Uh, first one is, you know, how does, how does Utah's increasing commercial and residential growth tie into these water planning and, and policy efforts? Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's not lost on any of us that um, we live in a great place and uh, the fastest growing state in the country over the last decade. There's two constraints that I uh, th think a lot of and weigh heavily on me as the speaker right now around, around that question about growth. One is affordable housing and the other is water. And uh, we have to get both right. And so if you were to be at Capitol Hill today, in fact, literally the last meeting I left before coming up here was a meeting about affordable housing. So this is where we're spending our time or these two issues. And uh, there are no sil sil silver bullets. Um, there's really two, uh, two areas or two tracks I see relative to water that we've got to be working on. The first is continued conservation. I said we use a lot less water per person than we used to, which is true, but we can be even better. Um, we haven't even seen, the truth is, of that $1 billion that you've seen the legislature invest primarily in conservation, maybe 10 or 15% of it's actually been implemented yet. I mean, there's a lag, right? Um, the, the 500 million we just appropriated two months ago can't even be spent until July. So, so there's a lot that's going on, but we're gonna have to keep, keep at it. Conservation is track one. The other is, uh, and this is very complex, but I showed you the uh, intricate and kind of interdependent way our system of water works in Utah. Well, if you just zoom out, uh, the fact is, Utah is not an isolated state that has these hard borders. We are interdependent on all the other states in the West. And uh, you're starting to see, uh, the Colorado River is a great example of this, where there's a lot more forced conversation about how to think about water on a regional basis instead of just on a state-by-state -state basis. So that's the other area we're focusing on, or will be focusing on. So switching to the agriculture side of the equation, what are some of the challenges you see in getting uh, more participation or, or more, maybe more uptake of this in the agricultural community? So uh, the agriculture optimization program was such a success, that first $70 million tranche of funding that we appropriated in 2022, we were oversubscribed and it was gone as soon as we made it available, um, or almost as soon as we made it available. Uh, that's why we were willing to go in and put another 200 million into that program this year, which will become available in July. So the agriculture community is very aware uh, of the challenge. It's, they know it's in their best interest uh, for a lot of reasons uh, to be willing partners. And I couldn't be happier. They get a bad rap that makes me really angry because they're, they're remarkable people doing great things and making really big sacrifices. Last year, when we had to have our lawns go a little brown, uh, they took 60, 70% reductions in their water. Uh, they're the ones that are taking the brunt of this, and uh, we've got to be very supportive and try to help them as much as we can, so. I really like this 
comment that it's, it's a long game mm -hmm. and that there are no silver bullets. And I think this applies to housing, to water, to the climate challenges we face. But maybe there's a lot of bronze buckshot, right? That there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of good ideas that there we are. can roll out. Yeah, and that's, I'll tell people, if you were to go back over the last two decades and say, what would have made a difference in the level of the Great Salt Lake? Well, um, all the mathematicians uh, tell me that uh, if we'd had an average of about 400,000 acre feet of water above the average we had, so an, another 400,000 acre feet of water a year going into the Great Salt Lake, we'd be in a remarkable spot. Well, this is just a math problem. We've got to find 400,000 acre feet, um, and you can see kind of the strategy. I mean, we know that agro optimization is at least 100,000 acre feet. We know that secondary water metering is 50 to 75,000 acre feet. You know, we have the church donating 20,000 acre feet. We're getting there, but we're not at 400,000 yet. So, Can you talk about the Great Salt Lake strike team a little bit, and maybe more broadly the role of our research universities and state agencies in providing you know, useful data to, to base decisions? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually been really fun and rewarding to watch uh, the U and Utah State in particular collaborate. Uh, on this, and uh, I've been in the legislature a decent amount of time, and uh, I am, I will tell you that whenever you give lawmakers good, credible information and do it in the right way, they will act and respond in a, in a productive way, and that is the role that the a Great Salt Lake Strike team, a role, and maybe the most important role, that they can play is uh, good information will drive good decisions by policymakers at a local or a state, a state level. And we love, uh, as policymakers, we love seeing our institutions work together uh, for a lot of different reasons. And it even adds more credibility uh, to the very credible work that's done, so. So the final question, there's a number of this in, the, in, the, in this general theme coming in is, what would you like to see at a federal level for action around the Great Salt Lake? And actually, I think I skipped that slide. Um, but uh, we have seen um, a lot of nice support from our federal delegation, uh, in particular, Senator Romney and Representative Moore uh, in their respective chambers have led efforts uh, to secure funding uh, for the Great Salt Lake and its restoration efforts, as well as to help draw attention to it and help um, with some policy pieces that are put in place. Um, I, honestly, I don't really want a lot of their help. They'll just make it worse. So we, we need them to kind of stay out of our way. Maybe some resources would be helpful, but, but uh, yeah, the, the, kind of the worst thing actually that could happen is they tried to wade in too much, to be honest. So well, not that I don't love them. So thank you for yeah. your leadership on the lake and thank you for being with yeah, us. Thank you for the invitation. Have a great day. Awesome, thank you. We are now breaking for lunch. Please do check out the student posters and also remember to vote on your favorite posters and circulate after lunch and talk to these incredible students. Let's thank Speaker Wilson again for being with us.